Thank you.
Thank you.
Well, good evening, everyone, and I want to thank you all for being here. This is going to be a very, very special evening. Uh, several of us had dinner with Rena last night, and I can tell you she is an engaging intellect, artist, and person, and you will be enthralled with her presentation tonight. I, I guarantee it. Uh, my name is Rodney Miller, and it's been my privilege for the last uh, almost 18 years to be the Dean of the College of Fine Arts here at Wichita State University. And for the last uh, um, 18 days almost, <laughs> it's been my privilege to be and pleasure to be the interim director of this museum. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out. It was kind of a yucky day, but I hope you, hopefully you didn't get too wet coming here. Um, I want to first of all acknowledge uh, the uh, donors who have contributed uh, so much to our exhibitions and our associated programs. Uh, Steve Overstreet, the American Scandinavian Foundation, the Consulate General of Finland in New York, Trish Higgins, Sandra Langel, Keith and Georgia Stevens, Lee and Ron Starkel, and Connie Bonfai. I cannot emphasize how important you, the Salon Circle, is in the support of this wonderful institution. Uh, your memberships make our exhibitions and our programs possible. And we're going to be unveiling our salon program for next year very, very soon. And we encourage you to tell friends and fellow patrons about the salon circle and what they will be uh, exposed to and engaged in if they do become salon circle members. Uh, funding for operational support for the museum comes through Wichita State University and through the city of Wichita. And as you all know, a museum is only as good as the people who populate it, as patrons, as uh, staff, and as volunteers. Uh, I am particular, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the Alliance and the Advisory Board. Uh, these are tireless, tireless uh, volunteers giving of their time, talent, and treasure to make this museum a better place. Uh, especially the volunteers who serve as docents um, they, they hold a special place in all of our hearts for what they do. And a shout out, obviously, to our students, uh, our student staff and our interns. Uh, most importantly, though, I want to acknowledge the staff um, of this wonderful institution. Over the last few weeks, I've gotten to know them on um, not just a professional level, but a personal level, and I am truly honored and pleased to call them colleagues 
uh, Ranjit Arab, who's the cre uh, creative communications manager, Journey Brown, who is our administrative assistant, Carolyn Koppel, who is our uh, membership and special events manager, Jana Irwin, who is head of education, Ksenia Gerstein, who is curator of modern and contemporary art, James Porter, who is exhibition designer and production manager, Joanna Raimondetta, who is our office and finance manager, and Joe Reinert, who is our registrar. Uh, could we give all of these people a round of applause? And now I'd like to introduce uh, Ksenia Gerstein, who is our curator of modern and contemporary art, who will make further introductions. Uh, that's a formidable mic. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Rodney. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'll be brief. I just want to welcome you to um, the fourth in our series of salon events on art affairs, about biennials, fairs, and the kind of ecosystem that exists around them. Um, just a few more thank yous that uh, I want to say first. Um, on our advisory board, we have a salon committee, and we want to thank them especially for their contributions in helping us as staff, and especially Carolyn, who is in the back and who is the um, mastermind and magician behind so many of the salon events. Um, the, the committee that helps that helps us do our work. Um, Kate Nicholson, who is the chair and who I'm guessing is on Zoom, if she's there. Hi, Kate. Um, Jerry Colgan, Tracy Hoover, I saw both Jerry and Tracy, uh, Ruthie Gillespie and Janice Van Sickle, we really appreciate their contributions. And finally, a special thank you to Jessica Emmerich Davies at Marriott Corporate Hills for their sponsorship of our salon events. So our guest tonight is Rena Banerjee, uh, who is an artist with an international reputation and who will speak about her experiences from the perspective of an artist of making and showing work at many of the world's best known and most interesting biennials and fairs. Rena was born in Kolkata, India, grew up in the United Kingdom and the United States and has resided uh, in New York City for 20, 30 years, a long time, <laughs> a long time. She draws on her multinational background and personal history as an immigrant to create work that focuses on ethnicity, race, migration, and diasporic um, histories and identities in America. Her fantastical and truly spectacular sculptures feature a wide range of globally sourced materials, textiles, colonial and historical domestic objects, while her drawings are inspired by Indian miniatures, Chinese silk paintings, and Aztec drawings. And I was telling Rena that I saw an exhibition of hers back in 2010 in London, and I didn't remember the name of the artist, but when I saw the images again, like I, that show was seared into my memory. It was so amazing, and I was really happy to finally put the artist's name with the work together again. Um, Rena's work has been shown and collected very widely across the globe, appearing in 14 biennials worldwide, including the 57th Venice Biennial, the Yokohama Triennial, and the Kochi Biennial. Her works are in the collections of the Whitney, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, Centre Pompidou, uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, San Jose Museum of Art, the Kiran Nadar Museum of Art, and the Brooklyn Museum, among many others. Uh, in 2018, uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, PAFA, and the San Jose Museum of Art co-organized a major uh, solo retrospective of Rina's work. and. Um, the Ulrich has a tangential connection to that history in that Jody Throckmorton, who was one of the two co-curators of the show, she was at PAFA. She, as I'm sure many of you remember and know, had been a curator at the Ulrich. So we, we're <laughs> there is a thread there somewhere. Um, but it was uh, a show featuring 60 works, sculptures, paintings, and videos that sort of captured or began to capture the breadth and complexity of Rena's artistic practice. And I'm excited to see her share glimpses of all that work uh, or some of that work um, with us tonight and her experiences exhibiting in the context of biennials. So please help me welcome Rena. I'm going to adjust this. <laughs> keep getting shorter, the speakers. 
Well, I'm Rena Banerjee, and I'm so happy to be here after a long a kind of away from any kind of communication with COVID. It's been almost two years of hiding. Uh, as artists, we often work alone, at least I do, even in collaboration. The possibility of coming and to bring the work to the larger audience is the moment in which we find ourselves, that we realize we are an artist. Otherwise, without knowing that and having that kind of interaction with the public, you don't really know you're an artist. Um, you're making something by yourself. And so when I think about studio practice and how it's really come to emerge into what we call contemporary art, I have to say it's a time when you realize that the world is a very large space and it's filled with not only the past, but this idea of the future. Um, to make work then becomes a huge responsibility of connecting with not just who we are in the locations that we find ourselves uh, growing up in and uh, finding community and friends and family, but also to find a way to reach out into the larger world, every place in the world. And it's a daunting time because this is the time when I as a graduate student realize that the world exists and that the world is also far away. And one of the places in which the world becomes an intimate place is in the museum. And as a child, I remember in second grade, I saw a painting at the Met and I realized I really wanted to be an artist. Um, of course, there were many things that I wanted to be along the way. Um, one of them was an engineer. And so I have this background of really uh, engaging in the sciences and my undergraduate degree was in the sciences. And what is important about the sciences that contributed to my vision that I exercise and practice in the studio is this idea that science is in the world. And it is a kind of language that as human beings, we often have to um, come to a realization that there is another language besides the spoken language. And it is about our world and art can do that. And the contemporary uh, vision of art included every culture. And how does one do that if they actually live in only one place? Uh, one of the ways that contemporary culture is able to do that is to allow us to have this ample travel and mobility where today we not only are, can say we were born in one place, but we live in another place, we work in another place, maybe you even commute to another place. And it allows us to understand that we have neighbors that are different from ourselves. So in this larger world, especially during COVID, where we had to go back to our homes and wait and see what happens, it became a, a very confident place to realize that we gain so much about who we are in the world by knowing what's out there. So diasporic cultures, as um, I began to realize when I was in, in graduate school, is really about understanding how you are more than one thing in the world. And that when you travel, you begin to see that you mean a different thing to the people that you're interacting with. And it creates a vocabulary that allows you to see that you're not only a person in a community, but you're an individual different from the community you reside in. So with that, I'm going to talk about how I took this journey to think about where the world is and how the world can be this larger place that is accessible. So let me see if I can do this. So when you're thinking about making art, and um, I thought about being here today in Kansas and a work that reminded me of Kansas was this kind of narrative which we all are familiar with, The Wizard of Oz. And many of you maybe 
have seen it, it remains a very important fixture in my mind, symbolic of this idea of the journey. Um, definitely the red shoes is the easier way to travel um, than the ones we've actually had to practice. But the journey is about leaving home and leaving what's inside and to create this world outside means to venture further inside of yourselves to see what you're made of. And what you're made of then becomes a, a, a journey that allows you to see that you have impact in the world as an individual. And that's what I think the work as an artist you inspire to make is to have this kind of connection with people that are not artists, that live different lives than yourselves. And can you meet that challenge when you have a very sp specific way of doing things and making things? So the Wizard of Oz was a kind of pleasurable place to begin this story of, I'll, I'll, yeah of um, realizing that this one little girl can send you on this journey into a bigger world. And in, in that story of The Wizard of Oz is this sense of journey, which I kind of show with this kind of lantern. It's a lantern, it's a hot air balloon maybe, and it realizes the story with the, if, you, if you're familiar with the narrative itself, there are monkeys, there are witches, there is the Emerald City, which I thought of as New York City, or maybe the city beyond New York City. But there is this idea of the taller urban place that you might find yourself. And to me, New York City kind of um, was this place that my parents spoke about that we would arrive to. Um, and I arrived to New York City when I was seven years old. And with its tall, glassy buildings, um, as a seven-year-old discovering museums, um, discovering the diversity of people, um, it was very apparent to me that a place where many things can happen is a place of a challenge of communication to bring who you are into the mix of things. And so there is this kind of pleasure in the largeness of this and the weight of this, if I can use the pointer, I think, here, of this big balloon, which is both lightweight and hollow, covered with cloth, textiles, fabrics. And the figure, which you can probably make out, is actually a small boy's figure and is dressed as if it's the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz with its pink wings. There's a horn tail. There's these kinds of branches that I use, a mix of materials that are brought together as if it's child's play. And during the, I would say the 90s, when I was uh, started to make a large sculpture out of small things, details, um, it was considered installation. And installation because basically you were bringing together and assembling uh, a whole like variety of objects to become one big sculpture. And so there was a lot of conversation about disciplines. I know we were talking about um, when that was and how things have changed since then, but there was this kind of idea that all the disciplines needed to remain separate. And if you were in sculpture, you were not therefore in painting. And all those things were brought into question during my school and studies, including culture itself. What can mix with what? And how many cultures can you represent? And so it was a very big challenge for me to really kind of discover other cultures when it was taboo, forbidden, not really understood how one can do that, the kind of clumsiness that we feel when we come to a new place, a boundary, a border that we have to cross. And there's a kind of danger, that aspect to it, which feels like flying. 
and it feels like flying where you can fall as well um, beneath you the distance um, these um, and and don't hesitate to ask I'm trying to find my pointer here we go um, on the floor is a map of the world, um, a rough map. Um, this particular work had been made in various places where the map had changed so different continents can move about. And so you were remaking the surface of the earth as a flat space on the floor. There were animals and soldiers and figurines and toys um, throughout the map. And the map was made of cowrie shells, which was considered an ancient currency. So you have this idea that the visibility of land itself um, depended on the currency and value of a place. So this kind of folds into this idea, who gets to be seen and who is not seen. And so there's a conflict of power and visibility that allows us to imagine the world and to cooperate with it. So over there on, I think you're right, is uh, the same piece in uh, of the larger view where you can see the other sculptures. This was a show that was in London in Haunch of Venison. And above you'll see other places that it had shown in. So a lot of the pieces can, because they're of installation form, this is where installation is different from sculpture, it can be displayed in a various ways, depending on the possibility of the site itself, the architecture of the space, and as well as the culture of the space. So one of the advantages of being in a different place is they haven't seen that work before. And to have it become a different thing in a different community, in a different culture, is some of the challenges of interacting with that culture. So what I set out to do was to find ways in which some of the installation work can vary from place to place. Um, this is an image of a piece of uh, sometimes in short I call Little Red Riding Hood and you can uh, right away recognize the, the kind of cape we're talking about. Um, and perhaps you can make out the face here. Uh, the face is of a man. He's a uh, kind of touristic find, a doll, a wooden doll that hangs in the entryway of perhaps Indian homes. And it is a man who's guarding your house. And you'll see even in today's homes, you'll see maybe a statue that graces the front, a kind of a uh, pleasurable thing, but also uh, an, an ominous thing to ward off. And so I love this idea of this kind of boundary that is foreboding and ominous in this and overlapping it with the idea of Little Red Riding Hood leaving home. For me, this is a way in which to talk about my immigrant identity, but all our experiences of leaving home and um, entering into the dangerous world. But here, Little Red Riding Hood herself is kind of dangerous looking in this world. She's really ready for this world. So I'm really taking a take on Little Red Riding Hood and transforming your vision of that story into a new story, remaking that story. She has several kind of eyes on her face. Um, growing in kind of awareness. She's becoming more awake. In some sense, the story of Little Red Riding Hood is of rites of passage, and it is about the growth of that individual to find that there are many facets of that person that has not been learned from being at home, that going in the outside world creates this more ferocious uh, little girl into womanhood. Um, so she has a tail. She has the body of a man in this particular rendering. The cape is full of mohair and um, rooster feathers. There is a mink lining that graces the rim of her jawline and head and creates the hood. And there are all these little like uh, creature-like spider-like things that grow from the back of her cape 
Her cape itself is like armor. It's made of knitted steel, and she has a tail, and she has these long, spiny, stilted legs. So she becomes like both an animal herself while she's in this journey, and she has this kind of reference to other kinds of animal, maybe an insect. So all these things come to play in a lot of the work, both animal and human, vegetation, the ocean, the kind of possibilities that allow us to imagine ourselves as different. Um, this is a work that was also in my retrospective, and um, I think I first made it in 2009. It is of the dying body. And there's a lot of reference to birth, the beginning, origin, especially in when thinking about where we're from, where we're going, and what will happen in the future. You're really thinking about this idea of making the future and seeing the end of the future in itself. Where does your future end? Where do, where do you contribute to make a new future for the following generation? This idea of inheritance and lineage come into play. So this is a kind of dark kind of vision of the cot, a bed. Um, and in this transformative bed, the body is in decay. And there's, a, um, again, a lot of cowrie shells. And there's a skull here. Um, and it's upholstered in fabric and wrapped. And then as the body becomes a singular spine with head, there is this tail that enters into the floor and continues all the way behind it of glass vials of medicine. A lot of my work uses old glassware, new glassware to talk about medicine, to talk about this idea of mobility, which really depended on our ability to take care of ourselves, to provide portable food, to provide enough food that people can go beyond their homes to reach other places for commerce, for transactions. So this, this sense of the tail is about what lingers, what stays at home in the bed and which goes away far away. That like is like our tail. And so there is this kind of continuation and dependence on the earth for that medicine. This is a uh, painting that I made that was in reference to the dodo bird. And you can see the resemblance of the bird with the feathers and the little wing here and the strange feet and the monstrous like skin that is scaly and amphibian-like and bird-like. And again, it's really like my references to the history and story of how the dodo bird became extinct and how sailors came to uh, stop on the island in which the dodo bird was and ate all the birds and how extinction works. It's a kind of consumption of the other until there is no more left. And, um, and this has a kind of darkness to it, but it's also this idea of helplessness um, that we don't know how much impact we have on nature itself, that nature really kind of depends on our intervention in order to preserve certain things. The sailors on these island were left behind and they had no other alternative but to eat what they could. Um, and so this kind of play on what the kind of microcosm of this island could project on our own politics and our own socialization is to see how much impact we have that we cannot foresee our own future. So the moment of decision making is, is a moment of fragility for us. It is a time where we have to kind of reflect on how mature we are to be able to take on the whole world as our garden. There's a lot of um, kind of landscapes uh, that reference all kinds of painting, Chinese painting. Um, there's kind of these uh, lingering vegetation 
And you'll see in a lot of my landscapes of the drawings, there is a kind of breaking up, a dismantling of a solid landscape. There are little puddles that suggest the landscape and the landscape kind of grows and emerges and rises and the body is kind of floating. So there's a floating quality also to the sculptures that you'll see. I'm gonna go on to this. This piece is called uh, Flourish. Of course, a lot of my titles have very long um, kind of length to them that tell you more. But for our, my talk today, I'm going to like tell you the short version of some of these titles as I remember them. Um, I can't remember all of them always and um, still be able to talk about the sculpture. Um, here, I think this piece in around 2010 and through to about 2013, I made a lot of wall sculpture. It was a, a popularized uh, and much in demand thing because it allowed people to own a piece that could be in their domestic space. It has the size of a painting. It has the flexibility of being on the wall as a sculpture. And I recognize that the, the size has a lot of impact in how intimate one feels. It is about the size of someone's torso. It has this kind of reach in that sense. And then the materials I incorporate into them are probably materials that you'd find at home as well. They range from beads to textiles to plastic materials to natural materials. In this particular piece, this was a commission that was um, began with the idea that I would use this salmon color, a uh, pink color for this collector. And from there, I took on other colors, of course, and even the, though the pink color is dominant. Um, and feather fans, which you see as just feathers here, are actually objects. So the object, in some sense, do not get dismantled, but you see them less as objects and more as materials, as other materials become incorporated into the sculpture. So the object, be begins to disappear without actually being physically unraveled. And that was something I was really interested in creating, is there a possibility to use something as is and make it work, uh, make it work so that it becomes something else, transforms itself, that you no longer recognize the object anymore. So this is another example of how the figures that I use have this floating quality. They almost look balloon-like, uh, bloated. They have um, reaches of their body that extends. Their appendages become um, deformed and continue to grow in other parts. And all these kinds of transformation of self, which we would think as being monstrous, become delightful too, they become humorous. And I think it's an amazing quality that human beings have to imagine both things simultaneously. And I think it's very important in the way we find um, innovative um, ways in which we can communicate to our neighbors, to people who are different from us. To invite this possibility is to suggest that we are truly human that we can think in multiple ways simultaneously. And so these figurative uh, works, for me, their wealth is in the expression that create a certain emotive quality about their smiles, their glances, their stares back at us, the kind of landscape that is both impossible and possible where we can recognize these as uh, mountains, but they look kind of funny and almost uh, humorous and comic-like. And they begin to do things that trees cannot do, which is reach into skies that are green and clouds that are green. And I, I thought this was an interesting one because it invites the idea of weather, the tornado that reaches into both sky and water 
that almost creates an umbilical cord into the sky, which is what I was thinking of when I made this, and I was not thinking of tornadoes at the time. Um, but what I do think of a lot of times is this kind of connection that these physical bodies, which cannot actually flow into the sky, begin to rise in a different way than we perceive of as angels, for example. And so they remain both animal and human and clumsy. So they invite this impossibility of being able to fly. And this is a room in the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art that is a very traditional room with all its like moldings and uh, walls and trim. And the paintings were hung in this room to um, really kind of talk about this inner world, inner world of flight. As you'll see a close up of this, that's one of those paintings on the wall. There. Uh, the umbrella is often used, the kind of rootedness and unrootedness of her tail where her body has fine roots that fall out of it. There's fruit that is growing. There's the sense of being in the sky. There's nets that float. So these kinds of motifs are very typical both in the sculpture as well as the paintings. The green body, um, and sometimes the pink body, the teal body, references this idea of being connected to nature. There is a little fish that is falling out of her hair, and there's little spikes, almost urchin-like. There is this flap of something growing out, and there's a possibility of her head becoming not unlike Medusa's head, but with other things, that she's really made of many things is the idea. And so it allows us to really expand our, our ideas of who we are as people and how we are part of all these things. Uh, this was one of the uh, earliest work. It was made in 1995 while I was a student to show you uh, how far the retrospective went back to. And during this time, I made mostly abstract paintings, and this is, was my most figurative one. And you'll see a little figure here that is a silhouette, and it was made with chopped up hair. I think it was an undergraduate student who lent me her hair after shaving her head. <laughs> and I said, I must do something with it. I'll put it in my painting. Um, a lot of pigment, there's fabric, there's insects uh, with whiskers, and um, mica is really interested in how almost anything can be made into pigment by cutting it up fine to make it into a powder. And so there's this kind of sense of alchemy in the work, this idea of cooking something up that goes into the painting and having the painting be a kind of um, magnet for the world that we can see. So this kind of treasure that we have, this is the window into a three-dimensional world is being inverted into a very physical world that it is not a window, but it is the surface itself that we're looking at when thinking about the materiality of that surface. And so he, here I, I'm really like thinking about the world out there beyond you know, planet Earth into other constellations, seeing the future where we're tumbling around in the larger universe and seeing our pollination, our ability to go to other places and bring our belongings. And this is a very important idea in my work is this thing that people do. They carry a lot of stuff with them when they go places. Um, it's always revisited when you find out that your bag doesn't fit in the carry-on and you're upset or, you know, on this flight over to Wichita, somebody's bag was announced going to be left behind in LaGuardia because they didn't claim it and it was just left there in, 
in the gate. So there was all these whispers of whose it was and why it happened and the suspicion around our belongings as you've all experienced through travel, especially now with high security and now with diseases we carry as well. Um, this has always been a, a problematic space of our mobility um, ha that has brought both crisis and maturity and awakening and allowance to realize that our bodies are not really our own, that they harbor all kinds of things besides our own inheritance and lineage and what our DNA is. It harbors all kinds of parasites and new beginnings that we take with us as our belonging. Um, and I don't think that will ever stop either. So this thing that we travel with is a kind of pollination in itself that we will into the future, that we cooperate and collaborate with. Um, and they include these other things that are manufactured, objects that are in excess in the world that become part of our trash. And so recycling is a part of what we've always done in sculpture in terms of gaining materials. Nothing is really new. Everything is um, arrives to our homes old. And so this idea of the new is of one that is fabricated. We will it to be dawned on us that we bought it new. And it's an important thing to think about when understanding how currency works, that they were made at one point in an unknown time, in an unknown place, and they're brought to our doorstep. This is an earlier work that uses um, maps of uh, buildings, their layouts and plans of buildings to rise during a contemporary period of the 1960s where there were a lot of buildings that were being modernized to create ele new electrical, new plumbing, new ventilation systems to make them modern. And I thought it was really important to use them because I thought this kind of circulation that we find essential in our building makes these buildings feel like they're bodies in themselves. They house light and air and good air and bad air, um, warmth. There are hot spots and cold spots just like our bodies. There are extremities that need to be warmed up like entryways. And so I think that to think of how textiles as I see them being used in my work and bodies, how they're painted in my uh, two-dimensional work, one has to think of architecture itself as a body. And that if bodies are walking through buildings and houses and homes and sheds and garages, then we have to think of uh, these buildings as our clothing. And so everything that we wear and we think of in connection to the body that stays still, we wear and we move with it. And we change the way it feels, works, functions, looks, according to our culture. And we invite in it our stories of lineage and inheritance. So the future is really about thinking about all these things that we've disciplined as separate categories of understanding to come together in this moment of everything being everywhere, things are becoming more cohesive. And so when we bring different disciplines to speak to each other, we're asking what is our connection to those disciplines? Some of my work has uh, interest in connecting bodies to the smallest things that I can see that are alive and they're insects and these are flies. And a lot of my work has this possibility of making the body look uh, insect-like with its many arms as you see here on your right. And um, little toes that don't look like human toes anymore and faces that change color with activity as she blows out 
new veins that connect and organize a ring of lies. Um, there is this kind of uh, moment of creating outside of the world. And again, a kind of drawing attention to the head, the headdress. I mentioned Medusa's head. But I'm also thinking of not only the headdress, but of the brain, uh, how the brain is activated by everything we see, that we consume all that we see as food. And it nourishes the way we see ourselves participate in the world. And what happens when we don't see enough, that we don't climb into the world knowing that we will see everything? Um, where does the limits of what we can see change what we think about what we see? Here, these two figures have, again, these kind of veining that is moved out of the body into the world to bring circulation, to bring pollination. They seem to be tumbling on puddles of water and all kinds of growths that come from in between the land, which is yellow, and the sky that's yellow. So all these kinds of charred spaces that are made with the coloration changing and the figures becoming human and animal-like and really undressed in that way. The sculptures, again, um, have this kind of sense of multiple appendages, tails and arm-like things that drop out, light bulbs that you recognize are used to create a sense of the floral. There's um, these pigeon feathers and fans and fur and horn here and uh, beads and what appears almost like jewelry upon the sculpture itself. The whole sculpture then invites the kind of entry for us to talk about jewelry as sculpture. You know, we were talking about buildings as clothing. And so now like jewelry, thinking of it in a different scale. Some of the uh, much earlier work where expressions became really important and pollination. This particular work has this references to bacteria in this piece. What, what are the expressions on the faces of bacteria? These uh, are two stills of two uh, videos that I made in around 2005. The first one is called Coconut Oops. Let me see, if, how did that happen? There we go. The first one is called Coconut Oil, and that's that where um, all these grooming techniques that massages the body to relax, that allow you to take care of yourself, to be taken care of, happens in the evening, um, and it allows us to think. Um, and it's this really interesting idea that in the activity of thinking is an activity that can happen in heightened form when you're most still. Um, and it requires this kind of almost loss of body where you're sailing or flying and your mind is free to roam. Um, so I was really interested in captivating that, but also talking about oil, lubrication, what allows us to move away from place to another place. Um, whether it's actually referencing the oil that actually fuels that economy of travel or the oil of culture that allows us to slip into another, a small connection into a different place where you feel welcomed enough to go, but is different and invites your curiosity to make your leap forward. And so all these things talk about these two different places, a place of rest and a place of activity. And below here is um, 
a video that is about the outside world, about traffic, uh, specifically roads that lead into other roads that le lead into other rivers. And this one is called When Scenes tra uh, Travel, Bubble, Bubble. So there's this kind of magic that we associate with getting off a plane and seeing a different place. It's almost as if you don't know how you got there. And how is it so different? And I had very much this feeling even when I encounter the weather being different, the vegetation being slightly off. Um, and it sends you into another world where you forget where you were before, you lose track of time, you enter into this bubble, so to speak. Um, more of the sculptures that hang gracefully on the wall that are a really kind of uh, manageable size that were very popular. Um, this one is about a recipe. It's a recipe that traveled from India to uh, uh, kind of clubhouses in London in Mayfair during the 1800s, where it was popular to have this kind of uh, treasure of Indian recipes that can be um, cooked up by Indian chefs. And this one was to do with chickpeas. And so I use these gourds to create this kind of floral quality, the tall grasses, the banana leaf, you know, some glass balls, some um, floral sticks, some uh, different kinds of gourds that were painted golden. Um, and some of the armature, which is all steel here, kind of replicate different parts of the body, a shoulder blade here. So it's really about this idea of what traveled during the time of our colonial period that I feel we're very much still part of. What do we want from other places as the first thing to try? And often it's food and clothing and it's objects, it's art, it's um, all these things that we already have, but we don't have this different kind. And so there's this appetite that allows us to venture. That is always part of our curiosity. And so this kind of communication can be had through our taste buds, through this kind of connection. So these are like frog-like figures, I feel, referencing the digestive tract and our connection between digesting the world through our tummies and through our breath, through our eyes, through our brain, and the world out there that still has not been tasted. This work, I was really thinking of this woman who has sat down on the floor vomiting. Um, so it has this kind of projectile of fluid that you see is which is the paint. And it kind of is playful with the finer kind of drawing, which is of the figure's face. Um, and then the hospital uh, blueprint, which talks, this is actually the Columbia, you know, you know Columbia Hospital of uh, Disease Control. And from 1968, so it has that kind of smudge blueprint kind of look to it where things were partially hand uh, drawn. Um, and so it was really interesting for me to talk about the body on top of these maps of hospitals that were being modernized. Um, how can the body be modernized? How does it expel and repel bad air, bad things that come inside of it? And a lot of my work from the very beginning really thought about the body inside and the body outside. And the kind of connections we don't allow ourselves, our imagination to think about because they're so messy, because they have to invite our kind of fear of death and fear of um, the other. So 
So these two sculptures are one of a, a budded flower, a flower that hasn't been born, is dark, maybe dark in the womb, and a flower that is fully open. It talks about pollination, it talks about growth. Um, this is a, a time when I was working in the retrospective to integrate the works with sculpture. And so this, the two figurative works here play upon it with the young child leaning over. Um, and here the, the figure is looking beyond and has a bow. And there is a sense of strength and adventure and uh, confidence. So this is the confident flower that has come to full bloom. And this is the more shy bud that has not opened. At this time, my daughter had just um, reached college level and went away. And so I, was, I wanted to make these two flowers to create this kind of uh, sense of the beginning and the middle um, to think about my own stages of growth. It's a very full view of some of these wall-mounted sculpture here, here, and a larger piece in the middle, its scale and size as they grow from this size to that size. Um, infectious migration, this work is referenced to, which is the title of a piece that I made in 2000 uh, for the Whitney Biennial. It talked about uh, AIDS epidemic at that time. And these two works, this is called uh, Friendly Fire. Of course, it has a longer title that reaches into more uh, words, but it really talks about this idea of uh, blindness um, and um, innocence among violence. And this one is The Mad Woman, Eve, and it talks about the madness of creating this kind of mythology around Eve. And what does it mean? What can it mean now? So there's a little monkey that rides here with horns and eggs, and there's large light bulbs on the bottom. And I'll show you some close-ups of those. So that's the middle sculpture that you see. And you see this flat piece on the wall and on the floor. They reference this kind of uh, the hospital mapping that you saw in the drawings. And they are cut out into the shape of um, maybe the intestine, maybe a gut, an organ. So I was really working with the reference to these kinds of amorphous shapes that come about in my paintings as clouds or abstraction. But they also reference these kinds of forms that we know very little about in terms of our familiarity with these shapes. Um, and then this tubing that you might have seen as red veins in some of the paintings become the sculpture. So that's kind of the co connection that I bring forward into the sculpture or the sculpture kind of breathes into the painting. There's a two-headed figure, there's arms, there's the body that looks like an insect's kind of body, maybe a wasp. And you'll see a closer up um, image of that. There's a lot of different materials, a lot of handiwork that goes into it. It's finally both uh, rich in materials and uh, handiwork, I call it. Uh, there's both uh, beading and sewing and things that have been poked into it. And there's some more image close-ups to see. There's a lot of kind of dribble of threading that make it very heavy and uh, visually draw you to the floor, uh, making it very kind of furry even. There's uh, fish bones, shells. These, these heads are actually light bulbs that have been dressed up. And this is the friendly fire 
piece that I pointed to in the larger view. And you can see how floral it is. And it, this came out of a story I read that was uh, not fictional. It was actually a uh, historical writing of a letter explaining how I think it was the, the Irish that were fighting the British. And the young soldiers were kind of hiding in thistle. And one of the soldiers had stepped into thistle and screamed. And uh, his neighbor soldier, who was a young soldier, was so startled, he started just shooting everything around him in fear. And so his own comrades had really fallen from that um, shooting. So it is this kind of um, remark on how we have very little control over our fears and our bodies in, in the kind of crisis that can be created out of a startle. This is uh, called premature prick, and it has a figurative kind of dressing of uh, a body here with a small little head here of uh, a deity. And there are these arms that fling out almost like an insect would you'd see when it's lying upside down and struggling to get back on its back, um, on its front, I should say. Um, there is this flutter of wing-like things on the sides, and she is kind of an angel at the same time, and there's kind of bottles that hang from her. Oops, I meant to show you longer. And there is the mad woman Eve with the different continents in these glass-like bottles that I think of as teardrops because light bulbs have that teardrop shape. Um, and she's coming forward to almost to leap off and there's an egg, this is her egg with, um, I used to paint these kinds of uh, large rivers that are very responsible for our ability to travel and to do commerce, to meet each other in different locations. So the egg in its sense of fertility allows us this possibility of pollinating different cities with commerce. The egg is also revisited in the way I understand the globe as an egg of fertility and the kind of circular moments that occur here on the floor as if there was an orbit around the earth and the planets can be visited in this kind of chandelier that you will see in a close up in the next image. This is called um, Take Me, Take Me to the Palace of Love and it's now uh, in the High Museum as we speak. Uh, it went up a couple of weeks ago and it will be up through into the summer. And uh, maybe you'll go to Atlanta and see it there. And it has been traveling for a long time since 2003 where it was made, it's a large structure. And you see all the kind of older paintings that have been installed in this room to talk about colonialism, about Orientalism and the advancement of um, architecture and the advancement of science and all that happened during this time of innovation where we were able to create these larger spaces. Um, there is these windows and the skin of the building that I've created here, which appears very temporary-like, made of thin plastic and rosy, are, is skin-like, so you can go inside of it um, and see through. It's also kind of a large ornament that dangles because it uh, hovers about a foot off the ground. So when you walk through it, it starts to turn a little bit and you find yourself a little off balance. And those are kind of the subtle ways in which um, the hanging of the work is, is very sensitive to how people use the piece when entering it. 
the uh, dome in the middle is hung and the uh, armature of the walls hang from that dome. It's anchored so it, it won't fly away or anything like that. But it's fairly lightweight. So here you see the interior of it and how it may look from inside. And you see this grand throne-like chair and the pie crust table. These are colonial furniture that was made in design with the collaboration between a woman in Salem, Massachusetts, and the uh, carpenter was in Madras and Mumbai, and the wood and the furniture was carved through letters of, of correspondence to make this piece both Indian and American simultaneously. And it's called this kind of category of furniture was very popularized in the United States, especially in uh, the Boston area in the 1800s. And it was very popular also in India and they're called Bombay Blackwood and in, in many other parts of Europe as well. So in many ways, I reference both furniture as well as objects and architecture to create this kind of more expansive space where the scale of the architecture is brought to be shrink or something small is made to look big um, and referencing uh, objects that have a kind of motif that is familiar to a shape. For example, the light bulb with painting, red paintings of continents, I suggest look like teardrops. Um, so the light bulb has this kind of teardrop drop shape. Here I took um, the structure of the umbrella, which is underneath this, what I call winter flower, and I suggest it as a flower. But the structure is steel, and it is an umbrella that was fabricated. It's about six feet in diameter, so it's very large. And it's made with this kind of honeycomb shape in the middle, which is the center of the flower and um, buffalo bison horns that are artificial. Um, these are uh, pigeon feathers, the fans that you see earlier. There's mink, there's the egg, ostrich egg. There's oyster shells all around here. And there are um, the spine of fishbone that create the surface in between the mink and the oyster shells. And so it's in winter flower is colorless. It is a, a winter's flower in that way. And I make a, a series of these umbrella flowers of different kinds to talk about different places, weather systems. Some of my earlier work And you can see this kind of reference to that winter flower with its shape here and the extensions of feathers. And this is a, a very fairly large drawing, I would say. And it's about five feet wide. And I think it was 38 inches uh, in height. And it is, this is really a mirror image which cuts right through her body and there's a little earth and the planets orbiting around her. It was kind of an image of my daughter getting very angry <laughs> where I thought she would be burst and be dismantled and join the universe. Um, there's the sun behind her head which keeps her sane <laughs> and positions her in the center. And, um, and all these are kind of bodies that are running from her temper. Um, so there is a lot of humor in the work, but it, it also talks about the body, you know, as being um, a planetary body, you know, constellation, how we think of the the word body and the object body 
and bodies as planets, um, to be able to be versatile in the way we imagine how we're socialized to conceive of other places. Um, I used to, I brought this in because uh, it really references how I used to in two year, like 2004, do these drawings. Very, very uh, much less work, but more text, as you can see here. Um, and so what I came to do was this expanse of work that is both dense, much denser now, but was not so dense and used text and didn't have long titles. Um, and then the titles became longer and there was less text in the uh, paper drawings. Some more sculpture. I'm gonna go a little uh, faster now that we've accumulated this vocabulary of um, things that I use. Uh, this is unique in the sense I was using a taxidermy, this is a crocodile's head and a ceramic horn that um, acts like a tongue. This is a, a kind of replica of a garual, which is an Asian crocodile, which is now extinct. And there's a, a, the earth here as burnt fruit. And there's an inky kind of melon-like dome, the kind of dome you saw in that pink Taj architecture is invited here to be a melon. And there's a sense of a jack-in-the-box kind of expression where the figure jumps out of this very feathery kind of bed, nest inside, talking about the human body. There's cowrie shells at the rim of this dome base, which can, it gives you a feeling of tooth a mouth that opens up where the animal reaches out. And the lighting allows you to see inside and outside. It's about, the dome itself is about six feet by five feet. And then the extension is about half that. So it extends quite a bit, maybe 15 feet all the way to its tip of its nose, where the mouth opens up. There's some more flying um, figures with little um, landscapes, I think of that. So you begin to see this vocabulary of outer space and um, the possibility of leaving as part of that diasporic immigrant identity and arriving and being born and things ending and the, these in-between places of transformation, becoming something else, seeing something monstrous. There is these kind of architecture of the umbrella, the dome, sacks, vessels, planets, insects, that there are little insects here around her head. This was at the Gimé Museum and it was positioned near other horns and textiles. There's a little mop, there's objects that are really simply what they look like but used in a different context to create a kind of awareness of the materials. Little, a small drawing here. And these figures floating in different kinds of clothing. Um, art papers that are used and collaged. And this is a, a large piece, and you can see the dome here as well. This is called the World Loss, and this is a map, in some sense, of the possibility of movement 
And there are a lot of little figures and built up areas for this that create a sense of adventure for the viewer. There's these fruits that look tear shaped and flowers that look almost cartoonish. And the scale of the figure kind of runs itself from very large to miniature. More droplets. Fruit and flower and leaping. Um, there's a sense that everything has movement in it. So I'm going to leave you at that slide or I should say that image. So you see over here, the vegetation itself creates a vein-like appearance to move through the figure and a kind of realization that all that is around them, these figures, even the atmosphere has small and big, that the scale of which changes in connection with the figure moving through it that in movement, everything that you knew to be one thing became many things. And that kind of idea is kind of invested in both the sculpture and the drawings um, to understand how important mobility is for our, our sense of um, being aware of our own lives and being present. How does reality get uh, measured? and how real we are in our own lives gets measured by this kind of movement in and out of what we are familiar with and what we're not familiar with. So I'd like to end my um, talk with that uh, idea in mind. If you wanted to ask any questions, even if you don't have questions, if you have maybe things you want me to talk more about, you're welcome to suggest that. Sure. Um, thanks, it was a really beautiful talk and your work's really beautiful. Um, I'm wondering, like, so hopefully I understood you right, but I noticed in a lot of the work, and I think you, bas I think you said this, like the strategy that seems to be at work in a lot of your pieces is like you root us, with figuration or some familiar material and something that feels familiar, but then the rest of the work draws us outward. And you talked about how moving outward, we also gain insight and in, inward as well. Um, is that true of your work? And if so, is that like a conscious strategy to sort of invite us into your interior and your experience? Or, or is that just, is the work more intuitive and you, it wasn't a conscious strategy and to sort of get us comfortable and then invite us to explore something new? Um, I think the, the passing of time uh, allows you to realize that what you thought was um, planned, strategic, or uh, that you hope to accomplish or achieve in your work, um, can happen that way, that there are other things that come into the work that you didn't plan. And in retrospect, and since I did have a retrospective <laughs> to really think about this, it's really true that there's an inevitable subject matter that rears itself in the work that is not planned that you have to recognize um, that is happening. And it's not just you who's recognizing, it's this conversation you have with the audience. Um, and the audience are all these different, you know, communities of people that tell you who you are, that make it a reality is very convincing. And then there is the work itself and the way you begin to learn to see it differently with that influence and that interaction socially with the larger community outside. Um, 
And I think that when I started out, um, I was really looking for that kind of structure where I know what I'm going to do and this is what I'm going to do. And there's a kind of um, naivete and security also in doing it that way. And then with time, you realize you are what you are. And no matter what, it keeps coming back to the same thing. But I think I noticed that I was really not using that many different materials. They, they, and they were familiar materials um, that I was drawn to that were being repeated, although people didn't recognize it as easily, that there was something hiding in the way I formatted it or the scale or how I changed the kind of juxtapositions of materials to create a new piece that looked very, very different, but still use glass and still use feather. So it was a kind of challenge to be able to run away from that. I was always looking for, to make it more unfamiliar, to maybe find an aspect of myself that I hadn't explored, what hadn't, hadn't I thought about. Um, and, you know, to really think about what, uh, what does it come out of? So the inside outside thing really was came out of becoming more familiar with my drawings and then understanding the objects of my sculpture had this possibility, as does everything. What is this inside? And it has to do with our mobility, like seeing a bottle from the outside and knowing it has inside and putting your hand in it or going inside a building and then going outside a building. And so a lot of these kinds of boundaries are only boundaries if you're not mobile. So I think that was really the connection I made with, um, you know, this identity politics that create a subject matter for all of us to enter into. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Let's give Rena a nice hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate you being able to be here. This is my... Uh, second talk after COVID where I physically went to a space and I'm really thank you for being here and supporting artists to come. Thank you.